Okay. Uh, so we're going to shift gears a little bit now and talk about spotted lanternfly. Um, and Eric Bittner is going to give us that presentation. Eric is a uh, Indiana DNR nursery inspector uh, with the Division of Entomology and Plant Pathology. He has a Bachelor of Science in Environmental Biology and a Master's of Environmental Science in 2006. He has over 22 years of experience uh, in the plant industry, including working with the state of Indiana for the last 16 years, uh, protecting the natural environment and planning and managing numerous insect and disease surveys, along with creating and implementing educational programs. Uh, he also has a business performing plant health care consultations uh, as a cer certified arborist and a tree risk assessment qualified professional. So Eric, um, it's yours. Take it away. All right. Thanks, Joe. And thanks, everyone, for inviting a, a Hoosier to a Kentucky meeting. So it was kind of fun to see all of the, the county boundaries in Kentucky. They're not square like the county boundaries are in, in Indiana. So that was a quite a unique picture to see. So I want to share a little bit about spotted lanternfly with you guys to let you know kind of what has happened within the state of Indiana within the last year, as well as to give more information to you as the public to help us. Um, so both in Indiana and in Kentucky, there's less than 10 people per state working as nursery inspectors, invasive insect, um, surveyors so we only have nine field staff and from what i understand joe and his crew is maybe four or five people so we need the public's help in trying to locate a lot of these invasive pests and for all of you working or owning forest land it's just a great benefit to us in our work uh, for you to have eyes out in the field to, to let us know what's going on um, so that's why I wanted to explain to you what's going on with spotted lanternfly, what it is, um, so that you can help us with our, our task. So the spotted lanternfly is not in Kentucky. Um, so don't be alarmed by that. It is in a neighboring county. I'll show you here later um, in Indiana. So spotted lanternfly, what is it? It is an invasive plant hopper. It's just a, stiff, uh, a group of insects uh, that feed heavily on phloem. Um, and produce a lot of honeydew and then sooty mold. I'll show you what that looks like in some subsequent pictures. So this is a, a pest that came in from Asia. Uh, it was first noted in 2014 in Berks County, Pennsylvania. Um, and it was found to be coming in on stone. So we import a lot of things into our country. We export a lot of things as well. Uh, but one major import into that area is stone uh, for landscaping, uh, for decorative um, purposes. And the spotted lanternfly, as you'll see also in some pictures, are great at laying their eggs on anything. And they laid their eggs on some of this stone that was brought in. And the spotted lanternfly was first found in 2014 in Pennsylvania and has since spread. So the big issue is, uh, that it can feed on lots of different plant species and a lot of our woodland species as well as our urban um, horticultural species as well. So it's a plant stressor, so it's going to add stress to that those issues that uh, Alexandra was talking about in the forest land of flooding, of tornadoes. Um, there's a lot of stress on plants and then now we're adding an insect that's feeding on it. So it can kill plants um, and damage them heavily, but it is majorly a, a plant stressor. And part of its feeding cycle, a lot of it is, is on the tree of heaven uh, as its preferred host. And we'll see some, from some pictures as well that they're in great swarms. So here's some pictures. Um, is that camera in the, can you see all of my slides or is the, the camera, do I need to minimize that on the side there? No, we can see your slide. Okay. It looks Just good. blocking on mine, great. All right. So. Spotted lanternfly is known to feed on seven, 70 different plant species in, in North America. So it's going to affect some agronomic crops. Uh, grapes, apples, and hops are going to be affected. So where this was first found is affecting vineyards. So we've got some vineyards in, in Indiana, and there are some in Kentucky. And they can heavily damage uh, grape vineyards. Uh, and they basically make the crops unsaleable uh, is, the, is the issue. 
They can also then feed on a lot of our ornamentals around our homes, uh, residential shade trees. It's gonna affect the, the lumber industry in feeding on maple and black walnut, um, as well as creating quarantine issues. So there's a preference change that happens throughout the spotted lanternfly's life cycle. I'll get to the life cycle here shortly. Um, but they're, as they're maturing throughout the year, they're gonna feed on different plant species. Generally speaking though, throughout the whole life cycle from nymph through adult, uh, which their feeding is gonna happen May through October uh, in Kentucky and Indiana, uh, it's gonna feed on grape and tree of heaven, as well as then it's gonna feed heavily on black walnut. But you're gonna find these um, spotted lanternfly feeding on anything from maples to sumacs, willows, again, ornamentals like roses and some of our perennials. So if you haven't already made yourself aware of, which most of you I think I've heard are, are forest owners or land owners, um, you know what tree of heaven is. Um, make sure that you can identify tree of heaven. It's a good tree species to kind of merge to and go to right away to look to see if spotted lanternfly is feeding on it. They're generally gonna be about nine feet in the air or higher when they're first on, on a, a tree. Um, and you'll see some of the coloration though is pretty distinct. But Killing Tree of Heaven is a management tool to try to get rid of that, which again, we're all trying to do anyway, but uh, it's another tool to give our, um, in, in order to fight against the spotted lanternfly infestation. So here's what the life cycle is so that you can know what to look for at what time of the year. Right now, they're um, in their egg masses. So eggs were starting to be laid in late September, October um, of last year. Uh, and then they're in these, um, kind of tacky, gummy looking um, egg masses. This is a cartoon drawing. The next slide will show you actual pictures of the spotted lanternfly so you can see what they look like as well in real life. But from October to June, uh, you're gonna have eggs. Um, insects have different uh, life cycles. So the, this particular insect, the spotted lanternfly has what we would call one generation per year. So that's gonna complete its life cycle in one calendar year you're not gonna have multiple egg hatchings throughout the calendar year as we do see in some of our other species of insects. Uh, so in around May to June, so we give calendar dates uh, to help people begin to think about when they're gonna start seeing these, but um, in the entomology world, calendars uh, are good for scheduling your personal activities. But as we all know, weather changes things and it's different every single year. So Something we use in entomology is growing degree days and trying to figure out when um, certain plants uh, are gonna be blooming and when they coincide with insects coming out. But for general speaking in Kentucky and Indiana, around May, <clears throat> again, it's gonna be weather dependent. <clears throat> if we get a warm spring or if we get a cool spring, it's gonna change when these, these insects are gonna be coming out and, and their development. Um, but if you're interested, look into growing degree days, and that's helpful to know when insects are going to develop. So May to June, you're going to see a first instar, uh, and then they're going to get a little bit larger, called our second instar, in June and July. And these first, second, and third instars are going to be black with white spots. But then as it starts to get larger into its fourth instar and starting to develop its wing coloration in its fourth instar in July to September is when you're gonna see this red coloration coming on. And that's actually when the homeowner in Indiana found uh, the spotted lanternfly was they saw this bright red insect that uh, is not uh, generally normal within <laughs> most of the insect world. And then in July through December, you're gonna have adults coming out and flying continuing to feed very heavily, and then laying their, their eggs. So here's just some actual pictures so you can see what uh, they look like. There's no scale in here, um, but you're gonna have the, the spotted lanternfly adult being about an inch to an inch and a half. It's a fairly large uh, insect. Um, this gal is next to a, an egg mass that is laid. So their egg masses uh, are really what we wanna be looking for when we're trying to um, move. So just like the spongy moth, uh, egg masses can be laid on almost anything. And that's where movement of RVs, outdoor patio furniture, stone, 
uh, can move the spotted lanternfly into different locations. Um, and that's what happened here in the state of Indiana. So here's just a picture of what a, an egg mass looks like. And then first, second, and third instars are again black with the white spots. And then the fourth instar is this bright red coloration. Here's some pictures from our actual site in Indiana that we found. Um, so this was a freshly laid egg mass that we found in, uh, must have been around in September. This was an old egg mass from the previous year, most likely. So they lay their eggs in these rows and then cover them with this silly putty gray looking material. Um, and yeah, those are just some good pictures to see. So what's gonna happen if you're in the woodlands and you happen to find um, spotted lanternfly is you can be looking for the egg masses and you can be looking for the adults uh, as well. And they're easily um, seeable once you, you get your eye trained. But what you're gonna see and what we're trying to train our field surveys for are what we would call ecological signs. So as I mentioned earlier, the spotted lanternfly are heavy phloem feeders. So they're sucking the sap out of the tree and then they're having to go to the bathroom and get rid of the, the waste that they don't need to, to use for energy production. And that waste is highly, uh, is a full of high amount of sugar. And then that sugar can grow mold. So this is then, we call that honeydew that they use when they go out uh, to the bathroom. And then uh, this is sooty mold that is growing on trees um, or shrubs or anything underneath um, that area where they're feeding. So you're gonna see this with the other um, insects in the same plant family, or in the same, excuse me, family as spotted lanternfly. Some scale insects, the soft scales, aphids, um, are going to be feeding in the same way. And you're perhaps somewhat familiar maybe with honeydew and sooty mold. And this is actually what's going to be the biggest, actually, I think this is one of the biggest issues um, with what's going to happen with spotted lanternfly. It's going to just ruin your outside experience. Um, from the stories we've heard in Pennsylvania, when they move out of the woodlands and into um, urban communities, there's so much honeydew raining down and so much sooty mold uh, that it ends up just ruining your outside experience. And I also mentioned that they're um, swarm feeders, so there's just massive amounts of them um, coming and feeding on, on the plants that, that may be in your landscape. The second major issue would be this guy right here. So because they're uh, excreting so much honeydew that's sugar-based, you get a lot of wasps and bees coming into the area to feed on that. So in the area within uh, Indiana, we actually could hear where the spotted lanternfly was before we actually found it. So we were looking for these ecological signs. We had an indication of where the homeowner had said he had seen it but we could hear all of the bees buzzing so loudly. It was almost as if you were inside of um, a honeybee um, colony. There were so many um, wasps and um, bees feeding on that sap. So stinging issues are, are a big issue too once it gets into the um, urban setting, if it does. So be looking when you're out and about um, in, in the woods for the sooty mold on plants. This is a pretty heavy picture of what it looks like but it can be much, much lighter. And if you see that uh, sooty mold, that may be something to just take a, a minute to look around and slowly um, look for maybe alanthus or walnut or maples to see if they're around and see if you're finding any of, of the spotted lanternfly. So we've already kind of mentioned a little bit about what's this, how's this gonna impact uh, forests and natural areas. So the honeydew and sooty mold uh, is just going to cover a lot of the understory plants. Um, and then reduce their ability to, to photosynthesize and, and slowly push out some of the understory um, issues. We then also, as, as Alexandra mentioned, we have all kinds of stresses in our natural environment, flooding, ice, drought. Um, so what actually has killed the tree? Well, spotted lanternfly is gonna be yet another issue that's gonna continually push um, this stress cycle farther down and possibly kill trees in the the, earth, uh, the woodlands as well as natural areas. And then as I mentioned, quarantines are gonna be an issue. Uh, so if we get um, spotted lanternfly in Kentucky, perhaps um, Joe's crew will be putting a quarantine on. We're gonna have a quarantine on the county 
um, in Indiana, which will then restrict certain movement of materials outside of that, that county. That's what's happening in Pennsylvania and Ohio. So log movement will be restricted um, in that area and have to have additional inspection. Um, so time will, will, will then slow down as far as movement of, of logging issues or um, if there's plant material that's grown in that area. So quarantines can also have an impact um, once and if spotted lanternfly gets into to Kentucky. So here's where spotted lanternfly is so far. So the blue counties are where uh, an established population has taken place. And the um, purplish dots are where people have found spotted lanternfly, but it's most likely a one-off. It was just a hitchhiker, either an adult or a nymph that, that hitched a ride somewhere. Um, so then we see down here uh, in Indiana where our infestation is. So I'll show you some close-up pictures here of our infestation in just a second. Um, so how is, is spotted lanternfly moved? So as they're moving naturally, they're feeding, they're trying to reproduce. Uh, so there's natural movement that occurs within insect populations. And that can be anywhere from three to four miles a year, we think, according to, to current research. Um, but most of the movement is because they're excellent, excellent hitchhikers. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, they can lay their egg masses on almost any type of material. Um, it doesn't really matter. Wherever they happen to be, they're going to lay their um, egg mass. So um, what has happened within Indiana is a homeowner lived in Berks County, Pennsylvania, and retired and decided to move to Indiana and um, moved all of their outdoor furniture, RV, trailers over. And most likely there was uh, an egg mass or two or 10, uh, we don't know for sure, on some of their material that they moved into. Because we can almost trace back to when they moved in to how large the population is that they accidentally brought it. So again, they just had no idea. They weren't aware that they were bringing it in. And then now we have uh, an infestation within Indiana. <clears throat> and then it's quite strange once you start canvassing an area and start talking to people in this very small, small rural county in Indiana, at the gas station and on the road, we've met probably three or four other families who have relatives or have moved in from an infested county within Pennsylvania. Yeah. So we are in a very mobile, transient world. Um, we're all, some of us still working remotely at times. So it's, it's interesting people movement that uh, in this small rural county of about 10,000 people, um, we ran into about five people who know of spotted lanternfly because of family or friends in Pennsylvania. So the big, big takeaway from this is check um, any material, anything that you um, are going to be moving outside of a county. So firewood, is something we wanna watch for and, and not move firewood. RVs, trailers, um, if you are into, there's lots of things you could be into. This, this family was into dog um, training and hunting. So they have a lot of trailers for their, carrying their dogs around or campers. Um, and they have a lot of people moving in and out of that property in, in uh, Indiana. So if you have a dog trailer, just even anything, um, look to make sure before you move out of an infested area uh, that you're not taking the spotted lantern fly. All right, so here is where, uh, just try to orient yourselves. Um, I just threw up this map real quickly while we were talking because I realized I didn't have a quick overview of where we were in Indiana. So here's Louisville down uh, in the, the lower portion and then Cincinnati, I tried to get up there. Markland Dam is a big point that a lot of people may know of. So this is just north of your counties. I believe Carroll and Gallatin counties are, are up in this area. And then the infestation is here in this red in Indiana and in Switzerland County. So here's Madison, Indiana. Several people are probably familiar with that. Um, so as we zoom in, um, here's the dam down here that you can cross from Kentucky into Indiana. Maybe people are familiar with the casino. There's resorts um, for a lot of RVs. Uh, so we're concerned about, again, movement unintentionally with the resort being down here and all along the river, there are lots of RV camps that uh, we want to watch for so that people aren't moving this material. So if you start to go up the hill here, 
Um, this is the area where we know spotted lanternfly is. We found it um, due to a homeowner calling us on July 9th. Um, so the call came in over 4th of July weekend, um, got the message and uh, went up there right away and collected several of these um, fourth instar larva that the homeowner who was born and raised in Switzerland County just had been outside his lot, whole life saw that this was abnormally looking insect. So he did some research and then called us thankfully. So that's the good thing about this insect is there's not a whole lot of other insects that look like it. So from a public standpoint, it's gonna be super easy for you to hopefully identify um, and, and send pictures in to uh, the, the correct people. So we went out with a crew, um, Kentucky folks came out as well. And this homeowner happens to have a nice Alanthus tree as a corner piece to his, his deck. He didn't really know that it was an invasive tree um, and found the spotted lantern fly on it. Here's, as we're starting to do a survey through the woods to look to see what is the extent of the infestation. And then we realized we've got an issue. There were a lot of spotted lanternfly in the area. And I mentioned that they feed in these swarms. So this is what they look like as they're, they're feeding. There's just so many of them and you can actually see with the sunlight behind you, it looks like it's raining on a bright sunny day, but that's all of their honeydew just falling down um, as they're, they're feeding and, and going to the bathroom. So just to give you a quick overview, we are at the beginning of understanding what we should do and, and how to attack this. We are going to try to eradicate it if we can. Um, we're not sure the extent of it. We started to do a delimit survey, trying to figure out the extent of where this, this pest was within this area. Um, we quickly realized it was a closer into a, a core maybe than we realized. So we said, let's stop delimiting for this year. We have a small window and we decided to start treating to try to kill and reduce the population of spotted lantern fly. So we went out and we started to trunk spray with an insecticide, a bark penetrant insecticide on Alanthus to move that insecticide material into the tree and kill any spotted lantern fly that were on them. These are all of the trees that we, we uh, sprayed, about 400 of them. And then we took a, a power sprayer and went along the whole woods edge that we could get to and time-wise up through in here and along this wood edge um, and did a cover spray on the wood edge for uh, spotted lantern fly as well. And then we walked all of these woods and tried to kill any Alanthus that was three inches in diameter and larger. We didn't try to kill all of the Alanthus because we didn't want to kill all of their feeding hosts and send them farther out than they already were. We wanted to keep them in and we wanted to be able to treat with an insecticide um, the Alanthus so that we could kill spotted lanternfly. And then this, uh, this is just a picture of us doing cover spray and backpack spray for the basal treatment of um, both triclopyr as an herbicide to kill the um, Alanthus. And then we use as an insecticide, dinotefuron as a bark applied um, insecticide for the Alanthus. And this was all done in September. Here's just some of the, the treatment. Our friends from Pennsylvania, um, where Spotted Lanternfly is, sent a crew in to help us and a lot of their spray equipment um, in order to kind of give us an overview of here's what we've done, here's how we can help you, here's maybe equipment you may need. But it was fascinating as far we would spray a tree and then as we turn around and walk back out the woods, there were dead spotted lanternfly dying that, that day with that um, bark spray of, of dinotefuron. It works very, very efficiently. Um, there's different ways that you can manage spotted lanternfly if it gets into Kentucky. Um, and we can probably talk about that. If you have questions, I see we're getting close to our time. Um, if you come into Indiana, that's fantastic. We've got lots of great natural areas in Indiana as well. Um, we, within the Division of Entomology, have a weekly review. So we're nursery inspectors as well as um, invasive insect um, surveyors. So we then send in information once a week to try to let the public know throughout the state of Indiana what's happening and what's occurring. 
and kind of a way to show different pictures to people. So anyone's welcome to subscribe to that. Um, you'll be able to see some of the things that we're seeing in Indiana and um, also maybe look for them in Kentucky if you're in nursery or horticulture and you like that. We have a 866 no exotic and perhaps Joe could unmute and tell everybody what is the reporting tool within Kentucky if they, they see something like spotted lanternfly? Uh, probably the best thing to do is just go to, um, we have a website, it's called unluckyforkentucky.com. And there's a uh, different, uh, everybody's listed there with email addresses and phone numbers. Um, that'd be the, right now that's the best way of, of doing it. We don't have a, that's something we're working towards is getting a dedicated email line or something for that. But right now, just unlucky for Kentucky. And thank you, Alexandra. Perfect. Yeah. So unlucky for Kentucky. If you see something within um, Kentucky, anything that Alexandra mentioned or spotted lanternfly, again, as I mentioned earlier, as you can see, this is this is the staff in Indiana that does all of the nursery inspections, any plant based product that gets exported to another country, any invasive pest survey. Sure, we do have some summer help as far as setting traps like gypsy moth or sorry, spongy moth. Um, as well, but there are nine of us in the state of Indiana plus a boss. Um, and then in Kentucky, there's not many as well. So we need help with you all getting out into the woods, enjoying your properties, enjoying the natural areas uh, that, that Kentucky has to offer, that Indiana has to offer. And if you see something, we just need your help in reporting it. And it doesn't matter if you think it's not uh, or you're trying to question, is it or is it not something damaging? We still would like you to report it because we'd rather drive around looking for something that's false than you not reporting it and that being a, an infestation that grows over over years before it gets reported. Um, so this is this is who I am. Um, if you have any questions in the future, um, if you're in Indiana, feel free to to reach out um, and. I will open the, the Q&A to see what is there. Okay. Uh, Eric, I have a quick question. Um, sure. This is Joe again. The, uh, I think y'all were gonna do some egg mass surveys. Um, I'm just curious, after the treatments, um, have you done those? And if so, what's, the, what's it looking like? Yes, so the answer is no, we have not done any um, egg mass surveys. Uh, so that would be a technique we could use in the winter time to walk the woods and look to see where spotted lanternfly is. Um, as I mentioned, we just don't have a lot of staff and we're doing a lot of presentations and um, industry meetings at this time of year. And we have not gotten out into the woods because um, I'm not sure that that's gonna be extremely worthwhile. Um, but we did go back late, late fall, early winter in November um, and we did not see many um, egg masses at that time. We had seen some fresh egg masses earlier in September when we were still treating. So we know that there was a population that was able to lay some eggs prior to us killing them. Um, and then we've been reaching out to homeowners, um, still trying to get a larger buy-in from um, homeowners outside of that initial area so that this year we can go in um, with that permission of homeowners to get on their property and start walking the woods. But it's a heavily uh, rural area, so just as you can imagine anyone who lives near uh, the river, um, you've got, uh, large hills, heavily wooded areas. There's a lot of, as our next speakers are gonna point out, there's a lot of junk in the woods to walk through because of invasive species. Um, some of the homeowners and landowners are, are taking care of some of that, but it's, it's hard to walk through. Um, so no, we have not um, gone back yet to, to look at that. Okay, well, thanks, um, Barry. Yeah, yeah. You, I think we're out of time. So if you will just uh, monitor those Q and A there and sure. change answers there, appreciate it. Thanks so much for your presentation, appreciate it. Thank you. And I just wanted to interject for those folks who are um, seeking ISA CEUs. Uh, the code for that talk is KY22031. I will also put that in the chat. So if you are seeking ISA CEUs, make sure you go to the website and enter that information. If you have 
questions on that, you can um, uh, chat me and I will answer those. Um, also, just kind of a note that if you haven't yet checked out the Q&A section, um, we've got a lot of questions answered there as well. So make sure to put your questions there. And thanks to our presenters who've already begun um, answering the questions um, in that portion.